Thank you all for coming. Um, this event started, had a genesis uh, months ago of how it was going to happen, but long story short, this is the book that was chosen for our One Book, One Alliance. It's called The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colored Blindness by Michelle Alexander. And I was really happy that this book was chosen. Um, mainly because it's, it's a documented and very scholarly work of a time that I personally and maybe a few of you lived through and you knew this stuff was going on, but here we have all the documentation about what was happening in terms of racial profiling in the um, prison system. Okay, so I'm gonna read a quote from the book of Michelle Alexander, and then I will let Diane introduce herself because she knows more about her than I do right now. <laughs> Although, um, uh, I guess we really met in November. November, but we talked on the phone before that. Yeah, Lots. So we knew each other from uh, different organizations uh, outside of work. So, okay, this is a quote from page 259 in the book, and it's about what Martin Luther King Jr. said uh, in 1967. Okay? And he was talking to his staff at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference retreat. And basically what he was talking about is that the civil rights movement needed to go further and become a human rights movement. So just, just listen. It is necessary for us to realize that we have moved from the era of civil rights to the era of human rights. For the past 12 years, we have been in a reform movement. Remember, this is 1967. I know a lot of you weren't born yet, but uh, it was a pretty tumultuous time in US history. But after Selma and the Voting Rights Bill, we moved into a new era, which must be an era of revolution. We must see that the great distinction between a reform movement and a revolutionary movement. We are called upon to raise the, we are called upon to raise certain basic questions about the whole society. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, I'd like to, um, start by thanking you guys for coming here and it's uh, amazing to me that as a university that you choose a book or a theme uh, for I don't know is it the year or the semester reading and, and this book had a significant impact on me and, and I didn't read it uh, a long time ago I literally just uh, read it last year and I think what I'd like to start um, is with my background. Um, I was hired in 1983, uh, and I retired as the first female lieutenant in an agency uh, in Southern California in Los Angeles called Redondo Beach Police Department. Um, I, was, it's, it, I grew up in the South Bay. Um, I was very fortunate. I had a very good career. And throughout my career, I tended to view the role of law enforcement a little bit differently than I think how law enforcement now views themselves today and part of it was because of the way that our agency and and the people who taught me what the meaning of law enforcement was um, so from a, a perspective of where I came from law enforcement in California is given its statutory authority under a penal code section called 832 of the penal code. And what's important about it is it doesn't describe us as police officers. It gives us police authority, but it describes us as peace officers. And there's a huge connotation between being a peace officer and serving your community and policing people. 
And so um, I started in 1983, Ronald Reagan was in office, and saw the escalation of the war on drugs and its impact not only in our communities uh, uh, on the, the macro level, but also on the micro level. Um, I worked a gang unit, I ran a gang unit, we were very involved in community-based policing, I started a school resource officer program, the best four years of my career working on a high school campus because I was able to do everything from intervention to gang intelligence. I got promoted to sergeant, I, um, I worked a, a career criminal narcotics unit, spent two years really trying to eliminate the drug problem in, a, in our community and walked away from that as what an abject failure. What the heck are we doing? We, this is not what law enforcement should be doing. It doesn't work. Then I got promoted to lieutenant and then ended up with a, a fairly significant back injury and I was uh, retired out. So I come from a lot of operational experience and I kind of call this, you know, from drug warrior to patriotic descent, why the, drug, the war on drugs has failed. That's surrounding me is all marijuana plants. We were, we were helicoptered in to uh, the mountains in between uh, Riverside and Orange County, dropped in via helicopter, and I spent three days chopping down and cutting marijuana down. The most arduous, grueling job that I have ever done in my whole entire life. But what I want to do is talk about LEAP and kind of why I'm in LEAP. LEAP is Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. It sounds kind of like a dichotomy. People uh, kind of go, what? Are you kidding? And, and LEAP was started in 2002 by five retired police officers who all had uh, significant law enforcement experience back on the East Coast. And they all took a look around after uh, serving successful careers and said, this doesn't work. So they started a nonprofit educational foundation that our goal is to educate the public, legislators, and to help move um, the criminal justice system, specifically in the drug war, from one of incarceration to treating drugs as a public health issue, which in fact it should be. So we're made up, uh, I, it's an international association now. We have chapters all over the world. Uh, in, in the last month, uh, LEAP members have testified in front of the UN Commission. They've been down in Mexico at, at uh, a couple uh, conferences, uh, meeting with uh, past and current presidents to talk about how to move forward and really in some aspects is to tell the United States we're done. You know, if you can't control your drug consumption problem, you know, what we're doing to Mexico as a country right now is horrible. We've had 50,000 deaths uh, since Calderon took effect, last five years. Um, our goals is the failure of our drug war policy, uh, the fiscal and social impact on our communities, um, for me, one of the most important things is to restore the public's respect for law enforcement. Just like prohibition in the 1920s and 30s, drug prohibition is no different, is that what it has done is it has corrupted our government and quite frankly, law enforcement. And not just in the normal course of corruption in the sense of you know graft and taking money, use of force, over incarceration, but by the federal government using federal grant funding, um, asset forfeiture as a way for law enforcement to pad their budgets. And so right now, from a fiscal aspect, is a lot of agencies throughout the nation, for sure in California, get federal grant money that takes resources away from investigating violent or property crime and directs them specifically just to address narcotics. And so what we're seeing from a law enforcement perspective is for the first time in, in years is um, our solvability factor for violent crimes, murders, rapes, robberies, assaults is dropped to a historic low. And it, that can be attributed directly to resources going to fight the war on drugs. Um, drug war facts. Drug arrest every 19 seconds in the nation. 
there's a marijuana arrest every 31 seconds. Um, 82% uh, of the uh, arrests were all for simple possession, uh, and I think everybody knows it at this point. Our high school students, 48% of them, by the time they graduate high school, have all used some type of illicit substance. Um, I have a, a son who's a sophomore in college. Uh, he grew up in Orange County, attended great schools, both private and public. And um, I would always do this experiment uh, through his high school years. If I give you or one of your friends 20 bucks, what are you guys going to come back with? Alcohol, tobacco, methamphetamine, marijuana, everybody, every kid said, oh, you want meth? We can get meth. You want marijuana? You want, what do you want? We can get it. You know, and the reason for it is because we've allowed um, the market to go to an unregulated market and uh, we've given up control to thugs and criminals, quite frankly. Um, the one that I like, uh, and I don't know if it's on here, uh, it's probably on another slide, is back in 2005, there was a survey that was conducted uh, by the National Chiefs of Police Association at, I think it was one of their conferences, and they had a lot of uh, sheriffs and a lot of upper management. 82% of our law enforcement leaders who attended that conference or participated in that survey feel that the drug war has failed in reducing consumption in the United States. But no one's willing to address it. What do we do? Why, you know, it's a failure. Why are we continuing to fund a failing strategy? Um, Albert Einstein on prohibition, I think that covers it, you know, is one of the reasons alcohol prohibition ended was simply because of the graft, the corruption, the deaths, and our society uh, at that point also from an economic perspective once again needed the tax revenue to survive. And, and, but more than anything else is we figured out we could not enforce alcohol prohibition, but yet we engage in it once again. It, it almost doesn't make any sense. Um, when I talk, I love questions. I don't like to just talk. So if you guys have questions or disagree or have comments, please, you know, is don't wait till the end. We can have this discussion throughout because I'll, I'll tend to forget and I'll move on. Um, Voices of Reform, I think this is really interesting. I met Beth through um, a social movement. And I think what's so important about what Michelle Alexander talks about, as did Martin Luther King uh, back in the 60s, is what does it take for us on a grassroots level to move the ball forward to get our government to do the right thing? And I think just like you saw with prohibition ending with alcohol, what you saw with the Vietnam War, with the movement, what you saw with civil rights, is you are now starting to get a collection of voices that are pretty disparate. You know, you have everything from George Shultz to Alice Huffman from the NAACP. You know, is, it is not a right or left issue. It is a nonpartisan human rights issue. More uh, 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 organizations are starting to call for, at least to start with, is the appropriate regulation and legalization of, of cannabis to start. Uh, and then we can start talking about decriminalizing other drugs and moving to a public health model. Um, the intent of drug policies. Uh, when, when I started in 1983, you know, Richard Nixon started the war on drugs, and every year the Office of the National uh, Drug Control Policy, the drug czar, comes out with a mission statement about what the intent of our drug policies are, and they're very simple. It's to reduce consumption, production, and distribution. The problem is, is what they do is if you go into their website, one, and it's a rhetorical goal, and it's unattainable. Everywhere you see a drug-free America. I just, you know, I'm astounded by that. I mean, even from a prescription level, from so we're not gonna be able to have coffee or a glass of wine, and if someone wants to smoke cigarettes, you know, that's their business. You know, it's 
Why are we engaged in a rhetorical goal that is completely unattainable in our society? But you go back to the money. I mean, there's a lot of nonprofit coalition movements that believe in this goal and who actively oppose and lobby legislators to create drug-free communities. To, and, and DARE is probably you know, my biggest pet peeve because it doesn't work. You know, why was the federal government when, in, in the 1980s when, when DARE started, when Nancy Reagan basically said, just say no. That, that was never a campaign strategy. She was interviewed. And it became this significant campaign strategy where the federal government spent millions and millions of dollars funding a untested and unproved educational program that we can now look at and say, it didn't work. So why are we still funding it? And there's still money out there. And if you go to the Dare America website, one of the things that you'll see is all the misinformation. So my, some of my philosophy has been with our children is, you know, drugs are bad. Abusive drugs are bad, OK? Um, and we can you know, debate a lot of different things. And, and I think that people can responsibly use drugs. I know people that responsibly use cannabis. I know both medically and personally. You know, um, and that's the thing. It's responsible use. So who should be addressing that? You can't dictate responsible use through telling people it's against the law. And especially if you start talking about addiction issues and other problems that we have in our community of why people use drugs or they don't use drugs. So it's always my point. What are we doing? Um, History of the war on drugs, and, and I don't know if people are really familiar. I know uh, there's, a, there's uh, Michelle Alexander touched about it a little bit is um, August Fulmer was a famous police chief. He professionalized law enforcement in California. And then it swept across the nation. One of the things that August Fulmer did is he was both the president of the International Association of Chiefs of Police as well as he was on the Wickersham Commi uh, Commission that helped end prohibition. And back in the 1930s, this is what he talked about in regards to the drug war. So 1914, the Harrison Act started, and um, opium, cocaine, marijuana were made illegal. And Vollmer, who is touted by the International Association of Chiefs of Police as one of the best police chiefs there, he's got a department at Cal Berkeley uh, that's the criminal justice department. I mean, his, his papers are very valued. There's tons of research that's still done. And this is what he said. And, and he talked about, which was really interesting with Vollmer, back then he felt that the government should provide a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical model for drug addicts, like Switzerland does, okay? And that the government, in order to prevent crime, should provide the drug addict, at cost, their drugs. And, but we're doing it with methadone right now which is actually much worse than heroin. You can be a functioning heroin addict. It's not good, but you in fact can be a functioning heroin addict, maintain your family, work, and everything else. And if we put it into a pharmaceutical model, that heroin addict could go to their doctor who would then prescribe an amount, not to get the person high, but to deal with the, the public health issue and the harm related to it. So I always throw Vollmer up at all these chiefs and all the legislators and all the, all the cops that I've lost, you know, kind of their friendship and go, hey, Vollmer said this back then. So 1914 Harrison Act, the first um, anti-narcotics act was loaded with racist tendencies for those that don't know it. Um, I found this, um, the Harrison Act uh, is, there's tons of public documents, and in fact, in the process of debating it, these are terms that were used by our politicians in debating why we should or should not outlaw drugs. 
but I can tell you that they don't teach that in the police academy. And seriously, it wasn't until I went back to school and started uh, educating myself um, after my brother died from, from a, uh, he was a, an addict and he died from a, a combination of psychotropic and alcohol. Uh, but that's my kind of part of my epiphany moments, uh, what led me to this. Um, 1914, heroin could be bought from the grocery stores. What kills me with this stat is the U.S. government at that point stated 1.3% of the U.S. population is addicted to some substance. Some substance. You know, there's a constant rate of addiction that people don't understand. Is there's drug abuse, there's responsible use, and then there's that constant addiction rate. So we enacted drastic laws for 1.3% of the population who was potentially addicted to drugs. 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act was largely the federal government's response to the use of marijuana by Mexicans and also jazz musicians and others, but it really permeated out of the southwest border. I was born in, yes? Quickly, uh, going back to the heroin in 1914. Yeah. Um, was this, when they were sold in grocery stores, was the sole purpose just to get high? No, it was medicinal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, in uh, what? Yeah, it was painkillers, Latimon. I mean, it was purely medicinal. Now, yes, they had an addiction problem, no doubt. But people weren't going out and raping and pillaging and robbing people for it. They were, um, way back when I was in nursing school, they were actually, I was working in the eye clinic, there were actually bottles everywhere of uh, tincture of cocaine. Yeah. to use for eye surgery, and it was just out there. Yeah. Now, yeah, forget it. it was, you know, you would. But, but again, the history goes to support Michelle Alexander's theory, is that um, I, had, I had several epiphany moments. My brother, um, my brother and I were really close. He started self-medicating when he was 11 or 12 years old. He died at 44. There's 14 months age difference, and I pretty much helped raise him his whole entire life. And he had long periods of sobriety interspersed with, you know, hit and bottom, self-medicating, everything from meth to pot to heroin to alcohol. And um, he lost his job. And so he lost his ability to buy his psychotropic meds, ended up moving into our house. He was dual diagnosed, clinical depression, manic, and really bad, and, and suicidal, the whole bit. So he started self-medicating with methamphetamine. And this was right as I was in the process of retiring. So my brother gets arrested for possession of a methamphetamine pipe and, and possession of methamphetamine. And we go to court. And Prop 36, uh, is available and my brother when he was in his early 20s had a felony conviction and walk into court and I had never been treated so badly by another public servant ever. Went up to the DA, introduced myself and, and not, I, not that I was looking for anything it's just you know is my brother's willing to plead guilty, he doesn't need an attorney, he wants Prop 36 and she just went off on me and basically said, no, your brother's gonna to go to state prison for 18 months to three years because of one previous felony conviction. And I said, okay, he, assign him a public defender. He's gonna plead not guilty. And I called up a, a friend, my husband and I hired a, a close personal friend as an attorney, and it took us six months to get him adjudicated and into a Prop 36 program that was a live-in facility. And it was, it started kind of my defining moments of, you know, and, and I had always viewed myself, because I worked in the gang unit, and, and I did a lot of, I mean, I tried to do job placement, I, I did a holistic law enforcement approach, you know, really worked with people to prevent them from getting into the system. 
And, and one of the things, and I had always, because my brother, been incredibly empathetic towards drug addicts and, and drug addiction, because I understood the impact on our family. My dad was an alcoholic. And um, I felt that there was a better way to deal with it. And sometimes people went to jail. Sometimes you had to take their kids away from them. I mean, I had a heroin addict um, who, when I walked into the house, um, her husband was selling heroin. She was a prostitute. And the floor was covered with cockroaches. It was, it, there was no food in the house. I mean, it was horrible. We took this baby, and it was a failure to thrive baby. And, and we saved the baby. So there's, there's times where you have to intervene and you have to do something like that. But there was not the resources that were available for people to help themselves and keep their families together because they're all going to incarceration. So my epiphany moment, that started some wheels turning and then my brother got locked up again and um, his girlfriend was a heroin addict and was selling heroin and um, I wouldn't bail him out but I did go and watch the trial, and I actually have the police report. The law enforcement agency that arrested him in Orange County lied about the probable cause. And uh, he, the case was actually dismissed under what's called the 1538 motion uh, because of it. And that was the second epiphany moment, but those three months in jail, my brother did well, got out, got clean, moved to New Orleans, and was doing really well until his accidental overdose. Um, and then Prop 19 came along, and um, Judge Jim Gray, who um, is out of Orange County, has been a, for the last 20 years, has been preaching that the drug war has failed. And he was at a debate, and I went in and, and listened to the debate. He got me in contact with Leap, and um, it's ever since, it's, it's been a, a really great thing for me. And, but it wasn't until 2004 that I had to self-educate myself. If I as a police officer knew this back when I was a police officer, maybe things, maybe there's other things I would have done that would have been different. And I think what happens is, is our law enforcement leaders and our police officer curriculum doesn't do a good enough job of saying, hey look, this is why when you go out in your community and you do these mass raids that people are sensitive to the issues of racism. You need to come up with different strategies so you don't impact people. You need to serve your constituents, not go in and be an occupier. President Nixon, Schaefer Commission, 1970. He, you know, he did this whole Schaefer Commission and they came back and said marijuana should not be a Schedule I substance. And he ignored it, completely ignored it, and started the road. So this is what the Schaefer Commission said. But we don't talk about it. I'd just like to say that no one has died from an overdose of marijuana. No one has killed anyone from too much marijuana. Uh, it's mostly when you hear about these crazed drug people, it's usually alcohol in combination or something. Remember, alcohol disinhibits you, so. 20, almost 22 years as a police officer, I have never once, and this is my anecdotal experience. I know other officers who have different stories, but this is my experience. And most of the people I know share this experience. Never once went to a house where someone who smoked pot, beat their wife, beat their kid, molested them, robbed someone, raped, pillaged, or was even involved in a fatal traffic accident. That's my experience. Can marijuana be dangerous? Absolutely. Prohibition's worse because it marginalizes whole sections of our communities. A, you know, a marijuana conviction, you can lose your federal student aid. You can apply for it back again. You've got to wait two years. You go through this whole process. And I talked to a kid recently who got his, his federal student aid money back after having a marijuana conviction. So he goes through this whole process. He calls them up and goes, so what do I answer on the FAFSA. You lie. You say you weren't convicted. Seriously. So, so, what are we, so what are we perpetuating as a governmental system? There's so, so there's that one question that says, have you ever been convicted of a drug crime? Well, he's still convicted, but because he peed clean, and he's still using, 
He's a medicinal marijuana patient. He's, you know, he's, he's still, um, uh, you know, he's been smart about it. He's, you know, however it happens to be. So when he calls up the federal government, says, oh, yeah, now you get to lie and say you haven't. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, how prevalent is drug use? 46% of the population, the past three presidents. And the addiction level is the exact And the addiction level has not changed. President Obama, um, from his position, I think everyone really thought that we were going to move at least more into a public health issue. The problem is, is he has not changed the um, staff positions of people who are still prohibitionists. Could he? Yes. Is he choosing to do it? No, I think that he believes it's unpopular at this point and that it won't gain him any traction. But what we've been told is that the war on drugs is no longer a war on our communities. What we've been told is that we're not going to go after uh, legitimate businesses and dispensaries who are operating with their state laws. And what has occurred has been completely different. Now, um, not talking because I don't want to talk politics, but you know, I'm hoping for his second term because there's no way Romney or Santorum will ever get elected in this country. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm hoping that because if he gets in as a second term that he can deal with this issue in a much more humane way and actually appoint people who understand what is going on in our country with, in regards to the mass incarceration of, of drug users. I yes? Yeah, I had the opportunity to hear Michelle Alexander interview. I don't remember the whole thing and I don't remember all the same. So oh, she's operate. fabulous, isn't she? But it sounds as though just just sitting here listening, I've been I've been really trying to not say anything because I really want to hear your sure. presentation. But uh, I am a member of the NAACP, and uh, I am familiar with Alice Hoffman. I don't agree with Alice Hoffman. Yes. Both of Alice Hoffman's policies. Sure. Uh, just to put it bluntly, um, I don't agree with the NAACP's position on this, and I also think that uh, it sounds as though. We're really focusing most of the argument on marijuana use as opposed to some of the other harder uh, drugs that can have, I think, more devastating effects than just quote unquote marijuana. Now, if that is the if that is the position for for LEAP and for other organizations that are supporting, uh, you know, making it legal, then I think that that's one argument. But I don't think that's coming out loud enough. If, if in fact that is. You know what, there, it's, I think it's really nuanced. I think you're correct in some aspects. Here, here's the thing, I think all of us can agree that drug abuse is harmful to our society. Correct? The only, the only issue yeah. I have with the, the whole debate yeah. is that we're putting everything in one pot. Correct. And, we stir it, and then we start taking pieces out. And so it confuses yeah. normal hey. people like me. And I'm going, well, what are we really talking so, about? So the, but see, I think we're talking about multiple things. There, there's been several experiments, and I was going to get to that, that we, can, we can talk about a little bit right here, is there's a couple different ways to approach it. I think from a social experiment, the one place, there is a huge difference between marijuana and someone who uses heroin. Huge difference. Someone who uses methamphetamine, someone who uses crack cocaine, there's, it's, it's night and day. So I think from a societal experiment, what we have to do is we have to separate marijuana out of that, which would do a tremendous amount of good, both fiscally, uh, it would open up our jails, it would allow a lot of other very positive things to happen. Once we do that social experiment, at the same time, we need to understand that people who are addicts, it's much more effective to treat them in a public health model than to lock them up. If they commit a crime outside of being a drug addict, they deserve to go to jail. And so there's, there's different steps along the way. 
So decriminalization would be a good place for us to start with hard drugs. And in fact, in California, is Senator Leno just introduced a bill that would reduce all felony drug possession arrests to simple misdemeanors. So that, in fact, would eliminate the stigmatization that Michelle Alexander calls from, from having a drug conviction. You would not get sent to state prison, and that should hopefully open up, if it passes, because I'm sure law enforcement will oppose it, if it passes, it should open up monies to, to do public health treatment options. But outside of, and it's no different than what, let's say, Portugal's doing now, and, and um, we'll get, get to the Portugal success, is Portugal decriminalized every single drug. And it's not, it's, it, yeah? Finish yeah, it's not, it's not a decriminalization like we know. Decriminalization in the United States still carries criminal penalties. It actually should be called depenalization, which is it's an administrative remedy to a drug problem. And in Portugal, so there's still consequences. Yeah, well, yes and no. The consequence. I'm not going to nail you down, Emma. No, no, but but there's not but there's not a criminal penalty. But if you're out in the open and you're smoking a joint or you have possession of a drug, then the cop can still stop you. You're not getting arrested. You're not getting a criminal record. You get cited into an administrative court who then potentially comes up with a list. You may get a $100 fine or they can recommend that you go into drug treatment. And they've had some tremendous success with that. Okay, if that law were to get passed that you just mentioned, yeah. would there be any uh, grandfathering in of all the people in the last, let's say, 20 years who never went to jail but flea bargain so they wouldn't have to get these horrible things and yet can't vote, can't, can't, can't get, uh, you know, their... Yeah. Would there be any of going back? Because if we don't I, somehow go back there, we're talking hundreds of years before we... I, you know, I, yeah. It, it, I'm and, talking about the ones who never even went to jail. Well, but, but it, if you're talking about if you've had a felony conviction, because right. it's a felony conviction which right. is what eliminates the voting and right. other issues. You can have a misdemeanor drug conviction and still have administrative right. penalties not like not I'm being about the felony case. You know what that's almost like beyond my pay grade. Yes, that would I mean I I would think that from a legislative process that in fact should be done. You know, so I can't answer your question. What the the problem with the decriminalization model is you're not eliminating the black market, which means that you still have the cartels and and, and you're never going to completely eliminate the black market because if we could you wouldn't be able to get drugs in prisons. You know, you're always in a free society, you're always going to have the black market issues, but you're going to greatly reduce the harm. And so I think what happens, and sometimes my only beef with, with Lee, is that we should be talking about regulation. You know, legalization is a good, you know, cliche. You know, cops say legalize drugs because people, it, it kind of, gets people's attention. But what LEAP is really talking about is an initiating a smart, cost-effective regulatory model that takes the, the cartels and the criminals out of it. And, you know, so, so there's different ways to get there, but I think, and, and most of the, the people who started LEAP and, and the executive director and everyone else believes that we have to start with marijuana. We have to lose the fear of marijuana and understand that you know it's going to um, it needs to be appropriately regulated. You know, and once we're there, then let's decriminalize and let's treat people and let's see what the differences are. You know, it's huge dollars. You know, the illegal drug market trades 300 percent profit. And we continue, and, and I haven't been able to uh, update this, but this is not 52 billion anymore, it's 55 billion now. So these numbers go up. So this is what we spend. You know, this was 2010, $169 for every man, woman, and child. What we're spending on just simply marijuana across the nation, 2.67 billion in, in Law enforcement costs, judicial prosecution, correctional-based expenses. It's a huge amount of money. 
let's take that money. What would that do to bolster um, academic institutions, public infrastructure, job creation? And, and, and I think we need to start looking at effective policing strategies based on scientific evidence, which law enforcement kind of doesn't do real well. Um, you know, so here we are, you know, how many years later? Constant addiction rate, 1.3% still. Yes? So what's the incentive for law enforcement to approach these matters differently? Where is the pressure going to come from to make that happen? Because that's, as I understand what you're saying, and certainly what um, Ms. Alexander is saying, that's where the pressure point is. It is. And that's what's creating this continuing incarceration process, which is really what we are trying to get at here. Yeah. Drugs are just the convenient it's the, it's the mechanism to do it. Jail. Yeah, it, there because be another one down the road. But this yeah. one, what do we do to get law enforcement on the other side of it? You, you know, education's a big part of it. Um, I think legislation's a huge portion of it. You know, we can talk about Occupy Wall Street um, and its impact on our society. And if Occupy Wall Street would stick to its one basic message, which was crony capitalism. I believe that crony capitalism on both sides of the political equation, and what, and what, they, what they're doing is that everyone's now using the, the relativist argument, which is, well, the Republicans are doing it, so we have to do it in order to get reelected, or they're doing it because we have to do it. No one's taking the moral high ground. We have to force our legislators to not allow public safety to lobby, quite frankly. I think it's un unethical. Law enforcement, just like the military, was placed into the executive branch of government for a particular reason. They weren't supposed to legislate laws. They weren't supposed to influence laws. They were supposed to serve their communities based on what their community's needs were. And I think that's a big portion of it. There's a, there's a, a lobbyist by the name of John Lavelle in California who lobbies for the California Narcotics Officers Association, who also lobbies for the California Chiefs Association. And any time you have any um, legislation that would go against law enforcement, he is up there getting in front of legislators and basically selling the public safety will support you in your election campaign. And it's both sides. Okay, this is and so I think that's one of the moves that we can push is we can have a demand. California, you know, what's the strongest other than this year where the teachers union has put more money into lobbying? Uh, but for the most part in the last 10 years, the California Peace Officers Association is the strongest law enforcement lobby, not just in California, but in the nation. They not only lobby here, but they lobby in Washington. And you know, for those that don't know it, they've also started victim support groups. So they, they, uh, they put lots of money against Prop 36. They were one of the big backers of three strikes. And so you have to go back to, it's about the money. So we're, we're going to need to address this. And, and the drug issues is, in fact, a part of it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I think it's a, a piece that you can pull out that shows the inefficiency of the system and how it's been corrupted. 300% um, profit margin, $500 billion international um, uh, is what the drug trade is worth across the whole entire world. So this was $255 million in $100 bills. That's... So... Prison overcrowding, we all know it. I mean, Michelle Alexander speaks about it in this book. I think this is, this is one of the stats that um, I am most embarrassed about. You know, until you start reading it and you start picking up um, the Pew, uh, Pew uh, Center on States research on 1 in 100, uh, when you start looking at it, you know, blacks constitute 53.5% of all persons who, who have a drug conviction, and yet, their drug prevalence rate is lower than whites. And part 
of the part of the issue has been is because of um, communities, low economics. Um, it's you know a white kid is probably sitting inside the house, not in the presence of law enforcement, but someone is calling because that kid is smoking pot out on the corner, and and, and then it's the mass militarization of law enforcement of, well, we're going to solve this gang problem in this issue. When I, when I started in law enforcement, the gang problem was about territory. It wasn't about drugs. Gangs have turned into drug trafficking organizations. Period, simple, end of story. It's not just about protecting their neighborhood. It's about making money and a lot of it. Um, South Africa, 1993. 2008. What are we doing as a society? We're supposed to be the most open and free society in the world, and this is, this is what we do to our own citizens? I find it appalling. You know, does anyone here think that the war on drugs has worked in our society? Even if, even if we disagree on how we solve it, I've probably, um, I lecture, you know, between five to ten times a month I, in the last two years. I've asked people at this point, you know, raise your hand if what we're doing is working successfully. Even in very conservative communities who are very pro-public safety, I don't ever get a hand up. So if, if we all agree that what we're doing is failing, why aren't our politicians and our law enforcement leaders doing it? You know, this is the bottom line. Drug dealers don't ask for ID. That's why marijuana is a gateway drug. Because your kid, my kid, you know, your nephew, your niece, your neighbor, walks in to get pot one day and the drug dealer says, oh, I don't have any, or spikes it with methamphetamine or PCP, or basically says, here, well, how about some cocaine today because we're out. That's how we get the gateway theory because it's not appropriately regulated. We should not be giving control up to the drugs and the criminals. I would argue that alcohol is the gateway. No, absolutely. No, I would too. But but that's I mean you still hear people are afraid. Right. You know, is marijuana is, and that's the other issue is we don't even adequately educate our children really to the the harms of drug abuse appropriately because we scare them at a very young age both about alcohol and about cigarettes and about marijuana and other drugs and we tell our kids I mean it's still on the the dare website you know if you're if you smoke marijuana you're gonna be a heroin addict so then our kids smoke pot and they don't get addicted to heroin and then they go well I'm gonna try something else yes uh, I can't remember if you said this or not what percentage of arrests uh, any given year is drug related huge the latest figures and I, I don't have my is um, all drug arrests, um, like we had 858,000 drug arrests last year, and that was according to the FBI. Uh, and no, I'm sorry, it was more, because that was just the pot arrest. There was like 1.6 million drug arrests, all drug arrests, from sales to cultivation, simple possession. Over 800,000 were simply for pot and the rest were for other harder drugs. That, out of that 1.6 million is, you know, we arrest, it's double what we're arresting for drug offenses versus what we're arresting for violent crimes or for property crimes. So, well, either, well, wait, either way, it sounds like it's too big of a business, too many people are getting paid, are relying on people to get arrested for drug offenses, for them to even have an incentive to even want to well, law, law enforcement gets a lot of incentives. They get a lot of incentives through asset forfeiture. They get a lot of incentives through federal grant funding. This year, uh, California got $72 million uh, up and down the, the state to police agencies simply to hire police officers to do nothing but narcotics arrests. But what happens with that is people aren't hiring police officers because what, what the public doesn't understand is with that federal budget, it, it doesn't cover benefits. It doesn't cover pension. It just covers the straight salary and costs, and they're short term. It's only three years. 
and you know, they're not necessarily, you have to apply for it and you may not get it the next time. So when a law enforcement leader accepts federal grant and City Hall accepts federal grants, they don't go out and hire three more police officers. They just divert that personnel from another assignment in order to get that money. There's tons of incentives that way, and it happens all the time. And, and, I, and I think in some aspects we have to remove that. You know, is prohibition's been tried all over the place. It hasn't worked, still doesn't work. International Association of Chiefs of Police in 2011 came out and said that what they want law enforcement to do in California, or not just in California, but across the nation, is to use scientific-based evidence and research practices to, in order to determine policy and, and to do what's best for our communities. We do it in other places. We don't do it in drug policy because they don't like what the scientific evidence shows. So we can talk treatment versus enforcement. This is 1994, the original report, the SAMHSA was 1996. 1994, I was um, a police officer still, I hadn't gotten promoted, and I've always been a big RAND fan, so I bring in the RAND report to briefing to share. And I you know, took it to a couple bosses, and you know, maybe we ought to be doing some more proactive work working with local community groups. There's, I, because I was a school resource officer at the time, there's a lot of grant-based funding to set up programs uh, in order to treat drug offenders. 1994, so supply versus demand analysis of cocaine and marijuana. For every dollar spent on drug treatment, it returns seven times the value. So for $1 spent on, on drug treatment, the taxpayer received $7 back in value. That's huge. It also showed domestic enforcement cost four times more than treatment, and that treatment was 23 times more effective than source control and supply side, which is all arrest, incarceration, enforcement. So we've had the information. Our government, SAMHSA, which is run by the federal government, has had this information as well, and so is the drug czar. And I think that's what's irritating to me about talking about developing smart, strategic policies, is SAMHSA's study was, you know, a year-long study. This is what they saw. If you treated people, drug selling was reduced by 78%, shoplifting by 82%, assaults by 78%, all crime went down, employment increased, and um, medical visits, both for inpatient mental health and standard medical, went down tremendously. And those costs haven't even, they, they couldn't even figure out what that cost was. In savings to the taxpayer, that's huge. And we ignore it because it doesn't make our communities and law enforcement money. So 2005, Rand Corporation, again, did a report, How Goes the Drug War? And what they said is, you know, let's every, on both sides of the equation, let's take the rhetoric out, both by the people who want to completely legalize drugs and both by the prohibitionists who want to continue in this fashion. And what they said is the drug war has failed by metrics. More money, we would have been much more uh, better off if more money had been expended on treatment less emphasis on mandatory minimums, which is what caused the mass incarceration rate to go on. And if as a governmental uh, entity, whether you were law enforcement or public health treatment, if we would have been much more sensitive to the variations of drugs and how best to treat it, that no one was really being as insightful as they should have been. And quite frankly, we continue in overspending for enforcement versus treatment. It's still two to one. Nothing's changed. You know, our federal government said it was going to change. It wasn't going to be a war on our communities. We we're going to treat people as a public health issue. It has not changed. Um, reclassification petition, going back to the marijuana thing. You know, the DEA keeps saying that uh, cannabis has no medical efficacy. Um, so right now, um, the governors of the state of Washington, Rhode Island, Vermont, Colorado, and there's others that are signing on board are asking the federal government to move um, cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2 so there can be scientific studies conducted to continue to see what the, the efficacy level of, of medicinal marijuana is. And what they did, and I have the report, is they have 756 citable studies 
that goes towards disproving what the DEA continues to say is that there is no medicinal value in cannabis. But there's no medicinal value in alcohol or cigarettes that I'm aware of, and yet our society is so hypocritical yeah. because the numbers say, why Why have we allowed those to proliferate throughout? And I, I think it comes down to a financial aspect. Somebody probably screwed up years ago and didn't realize they could have done the same thing with marijuana. Sure. Um, and made a whole ton of money legally. Well, I think, I think there's been a rhetorical war on drugs. And, you know, we can talk about the moral issues. And what I, what I try to say, because I'm not a theologian, okay, is from a moral perspective, drugs are neither good or bad. No different than guns. People always get irritated when I say, guns aren't good or bad. It's what people do with them. And so what we need to deal is with the behaviors associated with the drug use. So if you go out and rob and rape and hurt someone, you need to go to jail. But, you know, and, and we can have personal opinions that drugs are immoral based on our own religion, but our government should not be imposing those values in our society because it has caused more problems than it has good. You know, and, and, and I don't want my kid to use drugs, but, you know, I know that, you know, he's going to drink, so I'm going to teach him how to drink responsibly. I'm not going to teach him how to use drugs responsibly, but I'm sure as heck going to educate him and make certain he understands the ramifications. I don't want high school kids smoking pot. If you're 21 and you smoke a joint and you don't want to get in a car and you don't get in a car and drive, it's not our business. I also like the point that you made earlier, at least, you know, I'm, I'm very anti-alcohol and cigarettes. Yeah. And, and probably even less so than I am with those with what are currently illegal substances. But the good thing I see about, well, this sounds, the, the good way we administer alcohol is at least if you go somewhere legally buying it, it has some controls and regulations. Purity and the, levels. The point of buying something off the street that is supposedly what you believe to be something, you have no clue. Yeah. And that's my big fear for all the kids that I know are acquiring this stuff. Because sure. they're going to do it whether I tell them no or not. But they don't really know what is in their hand, what they end up smoking, what they end up inhaling, et cetera. Et cetera. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I have a friend who's actually a producer who, um, when he was, and he's, he's made a lot of movies you might know. Anyway, when his kids were growing up, he told his, and I never heard this from any father before, he told his kids, look, you know, I use drugs, you're going to use drugs, I'll get you whatever you need. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Don't buy from the street. Yeah, I know, and, and I understand that, but it just kind of scares me. Well, there's, there's a lot of different angles to this, and I think some of us probably can, can look at a lot of these yeah. angles because we're wearing different hats, whether it's a parent or yep. you know, mm -hmm. spoke to. I mean, I remember my mom buying my brother condoms because she said he's probably going to do it anyway and I thought huh you know so there's some <laughs> yeah hey you know what when, when when my son went to college my husband bought went to to Costco and bought him the industrial size condom and he said you're stupid if you don't think he's having sex already yeah. you know, you know so, so there's some logic to, to, to that uh, but then you know so as a parent another angle from a parental standpoint is you know when you've got a you've got a daughter and you go we legalize drugs. Do I really? Do I really want? To, and I'm using drugs plural here yeah. because I don't think any of the arguments I've heard, anything I've read, is doing a good enough job of singling out You're right. the different types of drugs. So I'm just going to leave it in the pot since it's all in there. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, it's part of the pot. Yeah. <laughs> but I like that. I like that. And so, and, and so I'm going, and I and I had this thought when all this argument came out here in California. I said, well, my daughter's getting married this summer, and if you know. The guy she's married decides, well, I just want to smoke a few joints tonight, and he's high as a kite. Now, again, I'm speaking from purely parental sure. standpoint, because I, I look at it from several different angles. And she's trying to talk to him about something, and he's totally stoned out and spaced yeah. out, and she calls me. Now, what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to do? We're, we're starting to venture into territories that we haven't before. 
The other hat that I wear is an ordained minister that says, if it's illegal, there's really no discussion here. It's illegal. I don't like the laws. I didn't make, I'm, 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 I'm governed to enforce the law. That's my commission. Yeah. So I've got a lot of different angles that yeah. I look at. Then I'm part of an organization that says, oh, we should legalize it. But the only reason I think anyway, some of the organizations are saying this, specifically the NAACP, is because I think there's been a lot of wrongs that, that hopefully this will make right. Yeah. And it'll, it will help, like you said, decrease some of that population. But you can't do it with a one-sided agenda. No. You have to have a holistic agenda because now they're coming out uh, and now they're not going in. So what are you going to do with all of yeah. this now? So I think it's been it's been looked at from a very short, short-sighted short viewpoint because no matter how much you, they talk about it, I still have tons of questions going, has anyone thought about this? Has anyone sure. thought about that? Now that these guys are hanging out on the streets and you're not arresting them, what are we going to do with them? They're unemployed. They're, I mean, the questions are just insurmountable in my mind. Well, and, and, that's, and that's really the question about what regulatory model are we going to use. So, so it's almost like it's hard because we're putting the cart in front of the horse. We can't even get to the regulatory models because we can't even get our politicians to have an honest conversation and discourse about the harms that prohibition has had. So we have to hammer, we have to have this discussion. And I think for the first time in our society, we're having discussions that are going to bring us to what is that regulatory model going to be? And there's all sorts of different regulatory models that can be applied, whether it's full legalization or just legalization of pot and regulation and then decriminalization and how do we divert our monies to make certain that there's job training, public infrastructure, good education, that type of stuff. Okay, so then, so you produce numbers up here in this presentation that show going from one way to another. Sure. Right? What is the cost? We don't know what the cost will be going from this way to the next way, which is the regulatory, all these things that you just discussed and listed and stuff. We don't know how those numbers can be. Sure. Okay? So if you're going to go from not to then to not, right? Yeah. Isn't it kind of a shell game, really, at this point, where money's come from, how much you have to filter in, how much you get to use? Because whatever you don't use on, on policing all of this, won't it then get shifted to then treating regulatory possibly but but isn't it can be a real sure but but isn't that a, but isn't but hang on a minute but isn't that a, but but isn't it a smarter way be, see I guess but there's an interim there though where you have people that are you're gonna like you said right now that you have people that you let out from jail that what do you do with them they're sitting I, out on the street I agree really with you. we don't know but I think the facts hey. have proven that what we're currently doing isn't is working. working so you that's have fine. to try and that's and, and that's and, and you know what and it's a really nuanced thing because there is there's lots of things that go on but I think what I'm what I'm one of the things that we have to go through this is to show that there's other strategies that we're, we as a governmental bodies have been unwilling to really discuss and to use effectively. This is Portugal. This is what you saw in 10 years when they completely decriminalized. And one of the things that's most important, this is my favorite thing. You know what they did? They made marijuana not sexy. They made it not, not sexy. What does that mean? It means don't our kids like to be rebels? and do what's illegal, it's not sexy in Portugal because it's not a big deal. I, I mean, you know, it's... <laughs> I wanted to point out to, regarding the cost. Um, she mentioned earlier that 800,000 arrests for marijuana, 1.6 million for all drugs. Marijuana, first of all, you shouldn't be going to jail. I don't think most people need treatment for smoking marijuana. So Which is true. We have to put 800 thousand people yeah. in treatment. We probably need to put in, you know, six hundred thousand people in treatment for not and, and and you know what it's probably it's probably a lot less because what you have to understand with the system right now, it's called coercive treatment. So if your kid gets caught with pot in the street and they go to juvenile court and maybe they get diverted out of the system or they just go to traffic court and they're forced to go, whether they have an addiction or not, they're forced to go to treatment. And then that stat is used as look at all these kids who are in drug treatment. Also, when I think specific to marijuana, when I think of marijuana, I don't just think about 
about the thug or the gang member that's on the corner smoking weed or trying to sell it with a dime bag. Also think about my closest friend's father who smoked every day of his life um, and who also went to work every day and yep. my friend was a straight A student. Yeah. So, so I think about yeah. that yeah. type of person as well and he could have easily gotten caught and been in yeah. prison. Yeah. Hang, hang on a minute. She had a question first. I, I, I think too there's a big group of people being missed here that have been plea bargained out of not going to jail or who were innocent who have now been Bland, you know, branded as felons, sure. and 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 they didn't, they were they were innocent, and they can't do all these things. We we created a society of innocent people that branded as felons yeah. who never went to jail. What about all those people? Yeah. What what was the cost to our thing that they can't get jobs, they can't find places? Count the cost. Okay. I mean, what about that cost? They would have been using. Yeah. It no, there is. There, there's, there's a lot. Um, Switzerland took a public health approach to heroin. This is what their results were. Felony crime down by more than 60%. Isn't that what we want in our communities? And in, in Switzerland, heroin is not legal. But, but the treatment issues, if you're a heroin addict, you go to your doctor and you deal with it. And they're, not, they're no longer you know, raping and pillage and stealing from the neighborhoods. Um, I think uh, across the world, outside of our country, even Iran, that actually their drug prevalence rate is uh, probably, I think, is just as high as ours at this point. And they also execute the seller and the user, depending on the circumstances. But even Iran is, is, is offering public health treatment uh, for heroin addicts now, even though they still, you know, cut off their heads. And, you know, the... <laughs> That's a, that's a novel way of doing it, you know, before they cut off their heads. Eventually, I'm not certain how many times, but so, so, you know, but this is, this is exactly what we're talking about. What are we going to do down the road? But, but I think really the, the most important question is, is we all can agree to disagree on how we get to a better strategy, but what I really ask is that people not because I think our politicians and our public safety leaders have done a very good job of, as I call it, is using rhetoric to strike fear into our communities about drug use. And they're not giving out all the information. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really tough thing. I, I, I lost my brother. This is my brother. I, I mean, makes me cry. I do this because of my brother. I lost my brother who was a drug addict because there wasn't a system in place to help him. You, you had a question, I know that we were going back and forth. Um, it wasn't really a question, I think it was more that I'm not, you can't, it's very difficult and you come with many facets like Preston said, I don't want to hear from the first name, but. It does. Um, it, way too many facets and when you say the term drug while I agree that marijuana probably is not an illegal drug technically based on the fact that it, it, that all of the research the you know the, um, the fact that you're not violent you know you know all these things that we were talking about I understand that piece but it all gets lumped into one and there's way too many points within that big lump that you have to take apart and so when I say about money we don't know what it looks like on the other end and when it comes to treatment that Get funneled into the treatment piece of it. We don't know that. It could. But that's what it should happen. But see, here's right, the thing. I agree, but the thing is, is that it's still money being spent, like but, either way. But I mean, it's spent in a better way. It's spent in a better way, and I agree with that too. But it's still money being spent. It's still taxpayer money. It's still all part of it. See, and then what do you do with all of the people that you, again, that you let out into the streets based on that? And on top of that, what do you do with, um, I lost my point right now. Um, there's, there's just, I just think there are many facets, many hats, many ways to look at it, many ways to slice and dice it, and it can't be, you can't just take marijuana out of it like that. But you there's can't take stuff. marijuana out of it. You can take marijuana out of it because literally the scientific evidence shows you that marijuana does not have any of the propensities for other hard drugs. You have to take marijuana out of it. I recently went to Montel Williams' dispensary in Sacramento and got a tour. What, you talk about the model of a business environment. 
you know, is what we've seen is the, the DEA is holding on to their power and their control with medicinal marijuana. And, and it's interesting because I'm back in school because I, I need to prop up my bachelor's degree in order to get to law school, so I'm, so I'm in a legal studies program right now. And one of the things that happened last year was Antonio Scalia, the most conservative Supreme Court justice, basically stated that the biggest mistake of the federal judiciary was in fact um, expanding their uh, arms and their grasp into the investigation and the enforcement, the prosecution of drug laws. That that should be a state by state basis. That the federal government should have no business in that. And we really do need to get back to that. So then we need to craft in California what's best for California. What the DOJ has done in their wholesale shutting down of a lot of dispensaries that were operating completely within California state guidelines. They, uh, the state of California has lost, I think, somewhere over $250 million in tax revenue. That's a lot of money. Okay, that's just the sales tax. They're not even counting the business license, the money paid into uh, the federal government because they pay their employees. I mean, they were paying, one of the dispensaries was paying their employees between 15 to 25 bucks an hour with full benefits. And so what we have to do is we need to remove the, first of all, cannabis, and I would agree with you, there's two different things. There's marijuana and then there's hard drugs, okay? Marijuana, we have to legalize, okay? Once we are not enforcing those laws, you're not gonna have a kids running chaos-free, smoking dope, walking down the street because all those crimes are still gonna be illegal. You can't walk down the street with a beer in your hand unless it's a public, you know, you know you're at a concert, you're at something like that, okay? You can't smoke a cigarette within 20 feet of here. You can't smoke a cigarette in a bar. And that's the regulatory model. And you're right, in some aspects, we're going to divert some money from here to here. But I, as a taxpayer, I'm willing to divert that money if it goes to higher education. Since the war on drugs, um, the prison budget now holds 11.5% of all of the state of California budget. It used to be that higher education had 11.5%. Higher education now has 6.5%. So I understand the fear. I really do. Because I, I struggle with the hard drug part of it. I'll be very honest with you. I, I, I'm, you know, I don't struggle with the marijuana part of it at all. You know, both from, because I know a lot of people simply in the last couple years who are both using it professionally and people who are using it medically that it is keeping them alive. And so why do we deny medicine to six patients and force them into the black market to deal with hardened criminals? And, and none of this is gonna happen overnight. There's no way on earth. But I believe that the impact of prohibition, specifically in the minority communities, I was born in Mexico City, I immigrated, you know, is um, the impact we've had in our minority communities with trying to prevent a drug from coming in here is not worth the cast anymore. It isn't. We have stigmatized whole segments of people, and that's not, I mean, that's not what I believe America is about as an immigrant. I came here, we were poor, I managed to put myself through school, I became successful, I get it. There's opportunity here. Is America perfect? Absolutely not. And Michelle Alexander clearly shows that. And this is a struggle for human rights and this isn't about allowing people chaos and letting them run free and you know become drug addicted or, or stoners. That's, that's not what any other country has experienced when they've done something as simple as decriminalize and they've lowered the priorities. I want my cops, if my mom gets killed, I want my cops to solve that. I don't want those precious resources going to arrest a medicinal marijuana patient or a collective owner or a heroin addict. 
when public health treatment is the much better option. Go ahead. Um, so I think what the real problem is for people that have anxiety about even thinking of the possibility of legalizing drugs is if it all drugs, and I think all drugs should be legalized, um, it doesn't mean that they're not bad for you because they're legalized. Alcohol, still bad for you. Smoking cigarettes, yeah. still bad for you. We're not saying that drugs are, are good. not good for us. We're saying that let them be legal and find a solution for for controlling the person who has the addiction, yeah. for giving someone, you know, uh, the gum that stops you from smoking, or whatever. You go to your doctor and you resolve your issue, and it also means that they're not committing crimes to get their fix. They're, yeah. They have a medical, you know, they can go to the doctor to figure out how to fix it. And, and, you know, what? Well, we're never going to be a crime-free society because that's not endemic in human nature. I mean, whether, you know, that's part of the part about free choice. Yeah, absolutely. It's freedom, and, but but even in, in in you know China has, you know the, the most dictatorship still, you still have crime and where people have you know get beheaded and whipped and all that other stuff. You still have. I mean that's, and so what we have to do is almost like what we've done with drunk driving and alcoholism and tobacco. Tobacco. I think there is a role in government and that there is some places that they've done a tremendous job. You know, you start talking about the fear issues. There was some legislation that was just introduced by a female legislator out of uh, Pomona that's a zero tolerance uh, for um, uh, cannabis in, in DUI. So what she did is she amended it and she said any trace level of marijuana in your system makes you uh, a drunk driver driving under the influence and there's no scientific evidence or base on that. So so what she's done is she took a report from the National Traffic Safety Bureau that said that um, in California 30 uh, percent there's been an increase of 30 percent of people who've been involved in fatal traffic accidents that have tested for drugs. But what she didn't note and what she didn't read because she was basing it on an OTS press release is that if you read further in the report it says just because they tested doesn't mean they were impaired and you can't make that correlation. So she's willing to criminalize a medicinal marijuana patient that maybe only smokes once a week so the minute you get stopped in a DUI stop, you know, are, are you a medicinal marijuana patient? Yes, I am. You're going to jail for DUI. That, that's, what I, that's what I was going to ask you a minute ago, was having to deal with impairment. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the studies say in terms of marijuana use and how much they're changing that. You know, it's interesting. I was just talking to, to um, a guy who's an expert with, witness in med, uh, medicinal marijuana cases, and there's a scientist that he knows that's working on um, a, a, a test to show impairment in marijuana. But what you have to understand is marijuana versus alcohol is completely different and metabolizes different. And so you can smoke a joint today, whether medicinally or for recreational, and 30 days from now, you're going to have some type of trace level. Now, from a law enforcement perspective, because I was a drug recognition expert, uh, and I worked the DUI team, and I arrested lots and lots of people, is we arrest people for driving under the influence of drugs all the time. It's a training issue. Wait, wait, what are we talking, marijuana? Marijuana, polydrug combinations, everything. Because, because from an impairment standpoint, the um, drug recognition training, the field sobriety test, the nystagmus, all of it is very similar. And so if you train your police officers appropriately, smartly, you can detect. And in fact, that OTS press release noted that you know, is we need to continue with training law enforcement, making them drug recognition experts, you know, conducting uh, DUI checkpoints and all of that to further reduce the, the drunk driving fatality rate. But what's the other interesting thing what this legislator didn't note in her legislation is that at this point, this last year, California, same report, which again, you know, stats, 
lies, damn lies, and statistics, is uh, you can make them, you know, however you leave things out, you know, people, people cherry pick. They use confirmation bias. You know, is our legislators and our law enforcement leaders use confirmation bias. They take a report and they pick out one piece and then do a press release byline that inflames the public. Okay, And so in this same report is, in California, we have had the lowest recorded level of driving under the influence fatality since record keeping began. So if we're doing that with alcohol related fatalities, we can do that with under the influence fatalities. We can do that through the same type of smart policing strategy. Instead, our they only, they only have it because it's, it's harder to you to text while you're driving if you're under the influence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Let me tell you. I think kids who are texting while they're driving instead of some people who smoke pot are more dangerous. I, you know, I, you know. So, so it's new. It's very nuanced, and you're absolutely right. We're talking about a lot of different things, but we're having the conversation. And as we get further into the conversation, there are things that you have smart legislators that can say, you know, this is what we need to do with the money. You could basically um, go with an initiative down the road that regulates marijuana, that the bottom line is whatever taxes are based out of this will go to public safety, to education, and you can signify it and you can set it aside. But we have to have that conversation. And, and if we don't have the conversation, we're repeated to make the same mistakes. And how many more of our children do we lose? Well, my, my thing right now is that I haven't made a very concrete opinion of either way. Sure. I need more education yeah. to do that. I don't feel like I have enough. But I know that there are many facets to this issue. And until I understand that, a good percentage of those, I can't, I can't say yeah. No, and you're right, but that's the most important thing, and that's why I'm down here, is, is education. Here's interesting with that Senate bill that, that decriminalizes this or, or reduces from felony to misdemeanor. This is what the legislative office said about a cost factor uh, at Alenos, is they estimated by reducing penalties for drug possession, we'll say the counties alone, 159 million annually, in addition to yearly savings for the state of 64.4 million. That's not chump change in any of our communities. So if we're already spending a portion of that money, why not spend that portion of that money in smart, effective, evidence-based programs that we know work? And to keep them funded. And to keep them funded. And that's exactly it, like Prop 36 was defunded after five years. So now the counties bear the cost for Prop 36 and no one is basically doing Prop 36 because there's no funding for public health treatment. So it's, it's that vicious circle, you know, on and on and on. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I agree, I agree with what you're saying. You know, we're talking 88 billion, but when we make the shift, because this, this, this is like world hunger, yeah. Uh, it may be 188 yeah. billion just to do the treatment, if you will. Because yeah, so many we don't know who are still yeah, using. We know about the ones who have, because they're incarcerated or they yeah. got little, you know, records. But we don't know about the others who. Here, who here, I'll, I'll throw out a great little number stat. Does uh, what's we, how much for a year of full time tuition here? Program. Okay, so, uh, let's any. 30, just 30, 30, 30. Is, that, is that the most expensive program? So we can make it more expensive. Okay, but okay. No. Okay, <laughs> so, so it costs $30,000 to attend one year here. Can anyone guess what the state of California costs for one inmate? 44600 Yeah, so to your point, <laughs> I would rather spend the money on on, even if it's double, I would rather spend the money on treatment than on incarceration. As long as we're sure, as long as it produces the results. The results. Well, absolutely. Because if we're talking, if it's all, we're almost talking a formula. If this, then that. We have evidence. We have evidence from Portugal. We have evidence from... Yeah, but, but you know, and, and, here's the other, and here's the other issue from harm reduction. How do we qualify success? Okay? Because we know 
with addicts that they fall off the wagon. And being an addict, being an alcoholic, is a constant battle and fight. Okay? So do we measure it by if we keep a family intact and the breadwinner is able to go out and work, yeah, he may fall off the wagon, but he's not going to jail, and his kids aren't part of the foster system, and dad's in the kid's life. Is that a measure of success? I think it is. Okay? And, and, and I'm not saying you're going to be able to end everything, but you know, I, I remember the first kid I took away from a parent. The, probably one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. And I just remember, and this was a child abuse. I mean, this wasn't a drug addict, someone was smoking pot. This is someone who was abusing their child. And I had this little four-year-old, and I'm carrying the little four-year-old down a set of stairs, and she is grabbing on to the rail, screaming at the top of her lungs for her mommy and for her daddy, okay? Sometimes with drug addicts, you know, I took, I had a, a lady who was an alcoholic. I took her kids because she allowed her boyfriend to beat her. And the 16-year-old finally jumped in and I told her, you're gonna die and I'm taking your kids because I'm unwilling to let your kids die. You wanna stay there, you know, this was before domestic violence was a big, big issue. I can't do anything. We arrested him and a month later he beat her to death. But those kids went to their parents. The grandparents. And, and in fact, on Facebook, I just got found a year ago and met the, the one little girl that, uh, that I had taken away. She's successful and she's an educator and I met her kid and her husband. It was amazing. And, and so there are times that we have to police people. We have a social contract with our communities. And that's what we have to remember. And sometimes we have to do difficult things. But I'm tired of law enforcement and by the end of my career I was tired of ruining people's lives because I had to enforce the law. The law is wrong. It's time to change the law and I think that's the hard part and I struggle with that because cops are moralists. I mean we're like I'm a rule follower. My husband yells at me all the time because I won't you know. You stop. I'm a, f I'm, yeah, I mean, I stop at stop sign. I'm a, yeah, I mean, I'm a rule follower. Just, you know, and, and we used to have kind of this joke, and, and joke about, you know, cops, kids, and preacher kids. They're either angels or devils. Okay? For the most part, <laughs> there's some truth to it. History has proven time and time again that the majority isn't always right. And that's correct. That's why we changed. So much. Yeah, and, and, and so, so the thing that I ask is as you educate yourself through this is understand, and I think that's where almost we have too much information, too much media, all our politicians are, and, and our law enforcement leaders survive on the, the sound bite. You gotta look past that sound bite, and, and it's, it's huge. And I'm not saying the system's gonna be perfect. I think we're gonna have problems with implementation and other things. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But what we're, what we're doing isn't working, and so now we're just throwing good money after bad. Oh, I want to bring back the money issue. One thing with legalizing, we keep saying, oh, the same amount of money is gonna be going to, or even more money is gonna be going to treatment, and, and um, things like that, but we'll also be making money with treatment by selling marijuana and taxing it and controlling the money, or controlling the, the commerce exchange for drugs yeah. in our own country versus doing it illegally outside of our country. Absolutely. And we're also no. going to make money by putting people hopefully back into the workplace where they're paying taxes, that they have the ability to be employed, that they have the ability to contribute back to their community. So, um, but other than that, anything else? That's it. I'll, I can. Scott, one Absolutely. I, I got a ton of scenarios, but I'm just asking. No, you can ask as many because I don't have any time. We got plenty of time. Steve, you, you're you're a manager. Your uh -huh. buddy comes to work, and you've had this great training program where they train managers. By yeah. Way, I'm a ah, so see. Like, yeah, yeah. So you, got, <laughs> so you got this this employee, and you're going, hmm, they. Why are they acting this way? Oh, my training says, I'll bet they are probably yeah. impaired or influenced by whether it's alcohol sure. or drugs. Alcohol you typically smell. Drugs, sometimes you can't always smell it. Sure. You, and so you probe and you ask questions. 
And because it has, it is no longer illegal, if you will, and use that word, to to engage in these substances when you're not at the workplace. But I, but I'm, I'm impaired a little bit when I come to work. See. That brings a whole nother dynamic into the whole argument because now what are my rights as a man? You still have the same rights. Because seriously. But I can't fire it's them because okay it's... The it's still not okay in the workplace. It's the, it's, the same, it's the same as alcohol. It's the same as if, if you have an employee who comes... Oh, it is, okay. It's the same. It's the same. Okay. So, so for like this year I was on an initiative. It was called marijuana, uh, Regulate Marijuana Like Wine. And that's one of the issues. It's not going to make it to the initiative, to the oh, ballot. No. The ballot. We couldn't get the funding. The, the, it's too fractionalized, which is another long story. Um, but... This initiative was written by conservative judges and police officers that addressed a lot of those issues, which was this in no way allows uh, or uh, impacts employer rights. If you have workplace rules that say you can't drink alcohol or smoke pot or be impaired, you get fired. It doesn't impact that at all. It didn't impact driving under the influence laws. It didn't impact. And so again, it's the regulatory model. And that's the problem. I, and, and I've had this discussion with the LEAP folks a lot. I hate the word legalize. I really do. Yeah, your because presentation, part of your issue, I think. It's, it is. It's, and I've said it. it it's, it's regulation. Legalization equates free for all, and it scares people. What we have to really discuss is appropriate regulatory models. And so there's been a group of us within LEAP who've been trying to get the founders to change the legalized, but again, that's kind of like their sound bite. So then it'll be REAP. Yeah, it'll be REAP. <laughs> I like REAP. You know, I like REAP. Regulate. I like that. Yeah. The reaper. The reaper. Yeah. The reaper. The reaper. yeah. So, you know, the leaper. You know, it's leaper. law enforcement against prohibition for regulation or something. <laughs> but you know what? And you're right. And see, and that's been my whole thing that words matter. Okay? It's no different than being a peace officer or being a police officer. Okay? It's it's a it's a different nuance. It's a different connotation. It's it means something more. And I've been having this argument with the leap folks for about two years. I hate legalization. I hate that term. I hate that term. <laughs> it's regulation. So I try to do regulation a lot and, and insert that so people aren't afraid. Because if you say we're going to legalize, people think there's a free for all, but there's not you still have to have an appropriate regulatory model. It's a very important distinction because there's also legal, what we call medicines, but which are actually drugs that yeah. people are using, you know, they're addicted to painkillers that they can get through a legalized prescription. Absolutely. That they're used incorrectly and that will impair them, will cause harm mm -hmm. to one another. So. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, again, you know, we're a free society. It's a real drug, drug, Use and abuse is a tough one for all of us. I just want us to, to look at it in a different aspect. And I don't have all the answers. But what I'm saying is there's a lot of law enforcement officers, if you really talk to law enforcement or even chiefs and administrators behind closed doors or politicians, they'll tell you they believe that the drug war has failed, but they're unwilling to say it publicly because they're afraid of their constituents and their city councils and the people that elect them or appoint them, that, that type of stuff. See, part, part of it is uh, demonizing people as opposed to their behavior. Yes. And that's what kind of harm reduction tells you, that philosophy that anything you can do to reduce the harm drugs do to the individual and the community. And society. And society, community broadly, you know, is success. So if I'm looking at your behavior, not you as a person, oh, that guy did, you know. You're being, what's your behavior? Well, your behavior is coming, let's say, coming to work impaired. Well, that's not acceptable. I'm your boss, and that's not yeah. acceptable. Regardless of what you use, it's the behavior. I'm not saying you as a person are terrible and horrible. Your behavior yeah. is, and I'm going to address your behavior, not marginalize and demonize you personally. And this is what Michelle Alexander is talking I, about. I, and I agree, with, I not agree with those perspectives, but I, you know, you're dealing with a whole, it's a whole cultural issue. Right, absolutely. But we have to talk about it. Oh, yeah, we well, have yeah. to 
bring it. I mean, people have to be honest about it. Politicians have to say, Obama has to say the drug war has not worked. Why can't he say that? Because he's trying to get elected. That's, that's the problem. You've been, and, that's, and that's the problem. That's the problem. No president wants to be a one-term president. Absolutely. What you do, if you really want to speak your heart and you really want to... You wait till the second term. There you go, you wait till the second so, term. So, but why did he say in the beginning... He oh, he's a rookie. <laughs> you know what, you're right. I mean, there's, you know... <laughs> it, yeah, yeah, and you know what, but, uh, but again, I think that's... I think that's the hard part, is we, ha we have to make our... So we have to make our politicians across the board understand that they're not our leaders. Just like law enforcement, we're not the leaders in our communities. We serve, they should serve us, quite frankly, and they don't. They serve themselves. Yep. And, and again, that's the how do we as collective communities and groups that have all these conflicts among so many different things. Get, you know, change the political process so it has some meaning so all of us feel like we're stakeholders. All of us feel that what we're doing is what's best for our society. Gavin Newsom said it, we were at the DPA conference when I finally met Beth, and he got up and he did a great speech and he said, you know what, in Sacramento every day you close doors, pretty much 90, 95% of all politicians say the drug wars failed. You know, we need to give those people the courage to come out, so to speak, out of the closet. I mean, it's, it's now, it's, you know, you, you hate to use that term, but it's like coming out of the closet. You know, you have to have the courage to say, it's not working. What can we do as a society? Let's engage our best minds that don't have a vested interest. I don't want law enforcement in our public health issues. They don't know any better. They've showed this for the last 40 years. Okay, I want people who are scientists and researchers who understand the dynamics of addiction, just like Volmar said. It's not law enforcement responsibility to investigate moralistic crimes. That's, you know, that's what I go to temple for. That's why you go to church. That's why you're an ordained minister, so you have an impact on your community. You have a better impact on your community than a, a cop telling a kid, you can't smoke a joint. Because you have that relationship with them. The drug war has, has put a wall between the communities and them. Yeah, because you can't legislate morality. Because you can't legislate morality. All you can do is you can, you can role model it. You can talk about it. You can teach it. I want my ministers and rabbis and priests and everyone to tell people, you know what, we believe that drug abuse is wrong. What are we going to do to help you be productive in your community? Okay. Hey! Abuse, but what about use? Abuse, but now we talk about I, Well, you know, no, 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 but you can use but you can use drugs. Drugs. There are prescription it's drugs that are legal. It's the abuse. Alcohol. It's not. It's not a continuum. It's not. A, it's not, a continuum. It's not a, I know. But again, where we, we're talking the whole pot again. I know. And, and, I, and I'm never going to agree to the. Well, I shouldn't say never. Sorry. But I just don't agree with the whole pot scenario. I know. Again. I get it. Because they're, they're. I mean, if we're just singling out marijuana, okay, I can. I can acquiesce. Yeah. Okay. You can't. You can't win. You know. Win. You, know, you got to give up a few challenges to get something. Sure. Better. Absolutely. But, but this idea of, well, what you do in your own home is your business. If you want to get stoned out on heroin and some of these other drugs, I don't even know the names of these drugs because yeah. I've never been down that road. But I've, I've heard enough of its impact. I've seen some of it. Because Absolutely. I relatives, like everyone else has relatives. Yep. And you can see the you can see the trend. You can see the impact on them, their kids, their kids' kids. It, it is so ridiculous that, as you said, sometimes you have to intervene. I agree 100 percent. But it is so huge that I threw my hands up and said, you know what, there's really nothing I can do except put a band-aid because I don't have enough wherewithal to really deal with that generational situation. They can't get jobs, they can't hold jobs. But if you but if you started at the level with the first person that started abusing drugs and there was appropriate public health treatment options, maybe you could stop it. I, I think your message can still stay yeah. that you were 
in no way, shape, or form in favor of it. And even though it will become penalized as opposed to criminalized, your message is still mm -hmm. not use this. Exactly. And it's it's always a choice like anything else that they do, whether they go down that path, and there will be some remedies in place as opposed to just incarcerating. But your message regardless of what happens, it should continue to be the same. It's, it's a bad path. Don't start. Yeah. But you can, can also I, educate. Yeah. Sorry. Let me ask a question. And this is like totally apples and oranges, and I realize that. But think in terms of somebody who's mentally ill that yeah. has a history of being violent, and they're on medication for whatever mental illness they have. They have the choice to go off their medication when they know that they might act out in a violent way, they know they might hurt somebody, they've done it in the past, okay? So we have that freedom now, or somebody in that situation can make that choice. Why can't I make the choice to use drugs? And then, and then if you, and, and then if, that yeah. I have an adverse impact, but. And if you, you, you yeah. have a choice right now, though, I would argue, Allison. I mean, everyone has a choice. Even if, whether but it's illegal, the person whether going off their meds isn't doing anything illegal. If I decide to go downtown on some corner and score some heroin, I'm breaking yeah. the law. Okay. So, well, you know, and I know it's apples and oranges, yeah. but. But which really brings up which really brings up the whole over incarceration, and let's talk about mental health issues, and let's talk about what happens with our mentally ill in regards to uh, no available treatment because. Uh, whether it's they're locked up in a prison facility, which is now our last bastion of mental health options, um, and no one is getting even effectively treated there because all the money is going into locking people up. And that's the thing that, you know, that we don't talk about. I mean, the California Prison Officers Union has a budget of $8 million a year that they use to lobby. That should be the crime. That it that is the thing. Crime. No, but but that's what I'm saying. I don't, you know, I I don't think I don't think I don't think we should allow lobbying at all. I think we should pay our legislators what you know, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year, and not allow anybody to lobby. That's the case. I'm the one. I'm the one. I get out of line. No, but 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 you know what? But you know what? You at least keep them honest then. No lobbying allowed. None. Period. Simple. Take the lobby now and give them what they mean. Yeah. I'm okay with it. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> yeah. 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 It, you know, it's it's a it's a tough. It's a really tough. It's a tough question. It's you know, and and I think all of us are ambivalent in a lot of different aspects. Be but I I just think that. We just have to get off the dime and move forward and, and give our politicians and our law enforcement leaders the ability to be honest and say, you know what, what we're doing isn't working. I, I, agree, with, I agree with change. I think, unfortunately, most of the people that are in decision-making positions are close to the, either in or close to my era. I've been growing up in that, uh, yeah. that era where all, some, a lot of this stuff was happening. And, and even if you talk about something as simple as, well, I shouldn't say simple, but something affirmative action. And they said, we don't need it anymore, so let's just end it. And I, and I wrote an article, and it's got published somehow, but I said, wait a minute, you, yeah. you're looking at this very short-sighted, you're looking at a few statistics, yeah. and they say this, however, you should always, I think, when you have a huge program, like we're talking, a huge issue, there should be, it should be a phase. -in. It's a phase so, in. So, absolutely. So saying, well, rather than this, and you take the opposite end of the spectrum, most of us who are not really, who are risk-averse, we're, we're, we're going to be very skeptical. So again, the presentation and to, yeah. and to reduce the skepticism is, is should be either this or that. It should be maybe even somewhere where you in the middle. You do it now. You've got proven because you see see there, and now you move on to phase two with full implementation. That's sort of always kind of my well. Process. But I think that's what I said when I said we need to start with marijuana. This is this is this is my if I was president if I was queen you know <laughs> for a day. <laughs> for a day. This would be my model. Let's start with legalizing marijuana. Period, simple, Regulate. end of story. Regulate. Let's start with appropriately regulating cannabis. Industrial hemp, we haven't even talked about the industrial hemp market and what we've done from a business perspective is what people don't realize is that industrial hemp that doesn't look anything like 
marijuana, can't get you high like marijuana, is a $3 billion industry outside the United States. That's what we import into the United States every year outside our borders in order to make clothing, food, and other products. Yet, because marijuana is classified as Schedule One, our agricultural farmers can't grow it. What? Really? Seriously? In this day and age of economics, why are we not out there actively looking for other ways to create jobs? And the industrial hemp market is huge. I mean, the natural industry, there's food, there's milk, there's butter, there's clothing, there's uh, Mercedes and BMW get um, industrial hemp and they use it for their plastic, you know, the real pretty Burlwood stuff. They use it as supplement to make the pretty... Marijuana takes the least amount of water, produces the most amount of oxygen. <laughs> Ab yeah. Absolutely. Transform our entire... Hemp oil, it can be used for fuel. You know, in this day and age of wanting to go green, seriously? <laughs> oh my God, why can't we just use hemp? So, so to help your argument, so the other, the other con to that is going to be, okay, it's a Pandora box. If I let you that, then where, where does the line get drawn? How, if you get one step, then, who's, then you're just gonna kinda keep going with that works. See, now let's do this one, and now let's do this one. So, so, the, so again, the fear, yeah. well, the stigmatism is, once you start going down that road. Slippery slope. You, you, just, you don't get off the road, and everything just follows them just in a different trailer at a different time. But it's not an either the or. or situation, yeah. okay? Use and abuse is on a continuum, right? People have chaotic use, and they can't function, they can't function at work, they come to work high, whatever, or they have episodic use. But it's on a continuum, Thanks, Mike. and that's, that's no, why, call, thank you know. You. Call me anytime. <laughs> it's yeah. okay. It's, you know, it's, you're not a horrible felon or you're not a felon. You know what I mean? It's not either or, it, it's on a continuum. Yeah. But I, I'm following the logic of, well, let's start. I'm, I'm just using your words. What? Yeah. And if I hear that, start just means I'm using that as my model now to introduce other things into the model to see sure. if they, they will fit too. So well, maybe but, they but, but maybe they will and maybe they won't. That's the experiment. So queen for the day. Designer drugs well, may not. Sense. You know what? Yeah. So 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 queen for the day. Handguns and hunting rifles. Rifles. To automatic weapons. Exactly. But there is. A distinct difference. They both are capable of doing the same damage. Exactly. Regulated properly. Yeah. So, so again, so here it is. It's, it is. It's a great. It's marijuana. And then, if that works, then I don't want to legalize other drugs yet. You know, let's let's look What's at the evidence. Let's, yeah. yeah, let's look at the evidence. Let's do scientific studies. Let and then and then at the same time that we have marijuana legalized, let's decriminalize other possession, like 13 other states currently do. Okay, it's not like California is going to be the first state to reduce felony to a misdemeanor. 13 other states do it. So let's do that to start, and let's not throw people in jail, and let's give people back their voting rights, and let's take the money that we would save, you know, that billions of dollars that Leno's, the legislative office said, and let's stick that into community programs. To and make sure the funding And make sure stays. the funding stays. <laughs> Okay, and if, and if that starts working, the problem with just decriminalization is you don't remove the black market. You don't remove the drug cartels, which continue to be an issue because what's happened in Portugal is the drug cartels are still fighting in Portugal over control of the drug market. So, you know, that's not eliminated. You know, you're never going to completely eliminate the black market, okay? But the more we remove people who are truly evil, because I believe in good and evil. I, I really, and then there's a continuum through there. There are people that should never see the light of day. You know, and so let's save our prisons for those people who, deserve who deserve to be there. And that's... Rehabilitated. so heinous that... Yeah, yeah. And, and, and those other people that deserve to be rehabilitated. When I first started in law enforcement, my favorite thing was working juvenile crimes because you had this whole continuum of things you could do with kids where we really treated kids in a rehabilitative process. And again, law enforcement lobbying, which I include the DAs, 
did this to our juvenile system where what they did is they basically removed from the judge's responsibility the ability to declare a minor as an adult felon or a juvenile felon and now it's up to the DA. So what have you seen is you've seen 13 years old, 14 year old, 15 year old who quite frankly, and I get it, they've hurt someone dramatically but when you're 13, 14 or 15 things change significantly by the time you're 25, 30, 40 or 50 and yet we have completely eliminated any rehabilitation for them. And, yeah, and, and, and again, you know, it, it's, it's, I call it the, you know, the political crime du jour. We always have the crime du jour, it, and I'm not saying this, you know, but something bad happens and we have an Amber Alert law. We have a Megan's law, we have this, we have that, and it's, it's politicians using our fear for public safety in order to consolidate power for themselves. And that's what's wrong with the system. It's personal. They're not doing what's right for the community. They're doing what's right for themselves. Private interest. Private interest. So anyway, thank you guys. It was great.